Okay, I think that we, we're ready. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, we're very uh, pleased to have Andrew Maski tonight to give us a very important lecture about the persecution of homosexuals during the Holocaust. Um, so many things that we still need to learn about the Holocaust and so many topics that we need to reach out to the young generation, especially in these uh, times that we're living in. Um, here in France, we know from the French government that three groups are targeting today and getting a lot of violence, the Jews, the Roma, and the homosexuals. So I think that it's very important that we continue teaching about the consequences of what was the Holocaust and the consequences of what of all these crimes the Germans committed against all these minorities and all these groups of people because they were different. And it helped new generations to be more tolerant and build a better society without violence. So thank you very much for joining us this to this conference tonight. And um, Father, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Andrei Umansky. So it's my honor to introduce uh, Andrei Umansky. Uh, Andrei is both an academic, he's uh, co-teaching with me in Georgetown and also teaching in Germany. He's also a lawyer. Uh, but he has the quality, I would say, to be both on the ground and both in the archives, but we very rare today. Uh, and so we are proud that he has chosen himself to introduce this difficult topic with, uh, about the persecution of homosexuals during uh, the, the, the regime of Hitler. Sometimes it's a taboo subject because it has incidences of, about today. He will explain you what happened during the war, before the war, but also, unfortunately, after the war. I give you the floor, Andre. Thank you very much, uh, Father Dubois. Yes, I'm very glad to talk uh, today about, about this topic. Um, I, I chose this topic uh, not by hasard. I did it because when I studied law as a young student, um, it was by, by chance that I, I encountered the uh, topic to the persecution of homosexuals, not, not uh, during wartime, but after World War II. Uh, because what I didn't know was that <clears throat> uh, decennies uh, of years in Germany, uh, being a homosexual man and having relationships with other men was forbidden by, by, by law. It was criminal. Uh, but when you're a student, and you go to uh, law classes, nobody is teaching you about, about this. Uh, you don't talk about uh, sexuality and crime during classes. You're talking about all kinds of topics, but not this. And it was by azar that I found uh, an old book, an old commentary. We call this in Germany with big books, uh, commentaries on uh, criminal law and articles. And I found this old commentary and the article 175, we'll deal with it later, uh, that puts under, under a prohibition a sexual relationship between men. And I couldn't believe it that uh, until the 70s, uh, this, uh, this uh, article existed and it was illegal and you could go to jail only because you were in a, in a relationship uh, with a man, as a man. So, and I, I, uh, I tried to understand it. I read more and more. And what I found out was that until 1990, it was still forbidden in some cases in Germany. So this is why I started to interest myself. Uh, what happened to the homosexuals uh, after the war, but as well, during the war and which evolution had we in Germany when it comes um, to homosexuality. So what, what I try to show you today is a quick overview of uh, what went on in uh, Nazi Germany and give you the um, big outlines in this country. So first of all, what, was, what happened before the war. Uh, what is interesting is that before the war, 
there were already uh, a criminal uh, article that forbade uh, homosexuality in Germany, but it wasn't enforced. Uh, you could live out your homosexuality in Germany before the war quite easily. So, for example, you see this picture of a couple in Berlin in the 20s, uh, the Weimar Republic, and it was quite usual for homosexuals to uh, go outside. You could go in homosexual bars or clubs uh, without uh, being, um, without having any problems with the police or anybody else. It was tolerated. There were some cases, but the police and the prosecution's office weren't interested in this, in this topic, in this issue. So that means that especially in Berlin, but as well in other cities like in Köln, uh, where I'm uh, right now, you had a, you had a big um, community, uh, gay community, men and women. At that time, uh, those people would call themselves Freunde, friends. This was this was the main uh, the main name for them. And so, for example, in Berlin was founded as well the very first uh, gay magazine in the world who was called Der Eigene. So you, you see here a cover from that time. And again, it's a good example that uh, even at that time, uh, when you see what, had, what, what was going on in that country, uh, Berlin was in Prussia, it was in East Germany, uh, and it was a very, still a very conservative state, a very conservative state as well when it comes to moral. And on the same time, you had as well all those liberal tendencies. So you, you could be, you, you had the right and you could uh, live your homosexual life as a man and as a woman quite freely compared uh, even to other countries in Europe. So it was this antagonism on the one hand, a very strong uh, moral ideology, especially in Russia, but on the same time as well, this liberty, especially in, in big cities like Berlin, Köln, and others. So here, for example, you see as well an example um, of the Eldorado. It was, it was a very big and one of the most important gay nightclubs in Berlin. Perhaps uh, those of you who know the musical and especially the movie Cabaret from the United States that was shown in the 70s, uh, they took a lot of ideas and scenes from the performances uh, that were shown in the El Dorado. So there is a lot of relationship between um, Cabaret and, and the El Dorado. So it was the main address in Berlin and you see the photo is from 1932. So for all of you, you know, Nazis came in 33. So just one year ago, um, it was quite calm and um, homosexuals could live their normal life. And then came 33. So when you go, when you Google online, you can see that, uh, that it says that the Nazis um, at the beginning tolerated uh, the homosexuals. Uh, I would say that it's is, is not quite exact, exact, because, you know, the Nazis had their very defined agenda and racial policy, their idea of um, the perfect Nazi state. And when it comes for the homosexual, it's the same thing when it comes to uh, the Jews, the Roma, or the disabled people. They don't fit in this image. You know, the Jews, they don't fit because of the right, racial ideology, because of the idea of the purity um, of, um, of the blood. Roma, same thing. Disabled people, same idea that because of their Aryan race needs needs to needs to sit, needs, uh, to stay healthy, and same thing with the homosexual. What's the problem for the Nazis with the homosexual? Well, 
they don't fit in the idea of the typical man because the Nazis have a problem with homosexual men. Why? Because a man needs to start a family. A man is the basis in the family of the family. So he should, he should get a lot of children with his wife. This is the ideology of the Nazis. A man can't be homosexual. While a lesbian woman, well, she can have children. So it can be tolerated. While a homosexual man, well, he doesn't want to have children. So that's not okay. So it was a very simple racial equation from the Nazis from the beginning, from the very beginning. But we know that the persecutions started not in January 33, not already when Adolf Hitler, Hitler became uh, chancellor of Germany, but it started gradually. And we, can, we come to the question why? Well, this is the person, this is the explanation why Nazis started to um, persecute the homosexuals only several months later. Because one of the most important characters, most important allies of Hitler was Ernst Röhm. He was the leader of the SA, Sturmabteilung. He was the most important man for Hitler to take over the streets, to make fear the people, Hitler's power. And he, Röhm, had a family, but he was openly gay. We know today that Hitler know, knew, knew, of course, that his friend and ally was gay. And he was totally okay with it, because for Hitler, it was um, it was a political game. It was he was important at that time, but as soon as Hitler uh, had the power in thirty three, became the boss in thirty three, chancellor of Nazi Germany, he wanted to get rid, as a typical dictator, of others who could be a danger for him to his place. So this is why, with the help of Himmler, he mounted a big story against Röhm saying, first of all, he's bought by France. France paid him 12 million Reichsmark and he's, an, he's an, a spy, a French spy. And to push uh, the thing even more, he denounced his homosexuality. And this is how um, Hitler used the homosexuality of his um, before then, uh, most important ally, Ernst Röhm, uh, to get rid of him and said, you see, um, he is a homosexual. He's, he's not fitting in the typical image of a Nazi man, so he has to go. And of course, he said publicly, uh, publicly, and uh, publicly, I never knew that I never knew that um, he was homosexual. And eventually, um, there was the so-called Röhm Putsch where Röhm was arrested and then eventually later he was killed. What happened to the homosexuals? Very quickly, only several months later, the first uh, persecution started. First of all, all those bars and meeting points were closed. So for example, here you see a collage of gay and lesbian bars that all that were closed. You see, you see the, uh, the pictures from before, all of them closed by the Nazis. This was the first step. So for example, you see where the photo of the El Dorado from 30, 30, 32, now you see it in March 33, it's already uh, closed. And you see what you see now is policemen standing before it and propaganda for Hitler's party because there were the elections coming up. So this is how they used the, this building now. What happened as well? Well, Nazis are in this case very efficient. So the first thing was to close all meeting points where homosexuals would meet and pressure them, make them fear, make them go away. Then they needed to go after the intellectuals. 
Same thing like, the, like they did with the Jewish people, pressure the intellectuals, make them go away. You see the same thing happened as well to the homosexual. Why? The example is when it comes to Magnus Hirschfeld. Magnus Hirschfeld was a physician and one of the most prominent people in the, in the 10th and the 20th, 20th century who explained that homosexuality is not a disease. It's something that you're born with. And he founded a very important institute uh, that was called Institut für Sexualwissenschaft. And of course, he was one of the first targets of the Nazis. He needed to be closed down and hunted away from the country. So what did the Nazis do? They would send in this uh, students from the Deutsche Studentenschaft, German students, and they would go already in May in this building to close down the institute, to find all the books that they were sown as propaganda. And you have the same ideology here, uh, like with all the literature from Jewish authors, all of this is now forbidden and needs to be destroyed. So you see, 10th May, you know the pictures of burning of the, of the books of Jewish authors or non-Aryan authors. Well, at the same time, Nazis would burn as well all the books, for example, from the Institute for Sexualwissenschaft, who would say that um, homosexuality is not a crime, that it's, um, that it's normal. So all of this became now as well un-German because as we recall, it wasn't fitting the racial ideology. Because when we put it down in a very basic term, this picture shows it directly. This is the image of the perfect German family. The man is an Aryan, he is blonde, blue eyes, he has a lot of children. And the women is here, is there in the German, in the Nazi society only to produce children. This is her sole role. And as soon uh, a woman has five or more children, she gets the mother's cross in, in, the, in the Nazi society. So this was the idea. And of course, the Jews, the Roma, the disabled people, the homosexual, homosexual they don't fit in this idea. What comes then? So in the next years, the Nazis will now hunt down all the homosexual men. How they will do it? Well, this is a typical uh, top, uh, task for Heinrich Himmler and his um, SS and Gestapo. They would uh, seek out for homosexuals and list them. The idea was we need to find out all the homosexuals in Nazi Germany and list them and put them away. And here you have, for example, observation photographs of a um, homosexual man. Where is he? What is he doing? Where is he going? Who is, me who is he meeting with? Um, so this is how uh, things would go. And then as soon as homosexuals would be arrested, um, police would pressure them to give away even more names of homosexuals. And this is how you, had, you would have thousands and thousands of names found out. In 36, there was even a special um, uh, Reichsorganisation for, um, for the uh, homosexuals and abortion. And uh, it was created by Heinrich Himmler. And the idea was to file and, and uh, document all the homosexuals, all the homosexual men they would find. So again, you see the same thing like with the, with the Jews or the Roma identification. And this would be the first step before sending those people um, from the Reich territory or at least in concentration camps. So again, this is a photograph of a man. And what's as well very important, this is why I put you again this uh, paragraph, article 175 from the criminal code. It was legalized. 
Nazis were very uh, keen of legal term, legal foundation. There was an article in the criminal code um, in the Nazi Germany, so you could arrest a homosexual man because it was the law. So this is how Nazis perverted and used the law uh, for their aim. Just a quick look on this criminal code, indecency between men. Until 35, it was written a man who commits unnatural indecency. So it's very vague. You don't know exactly what does it mean. So this is why until the Nazis, there weren't so many cases against, against homosexual, uh, homosexual men. But the Nazis, they, they would strike the unnatural and it's already enough to have an indecency with another man. So some prosecutors and judges said, well, even if a man might look in a strange way to another man, this is already indecency. So you see how easily was it to target people and it was enough to put people away in prison. Again, you see the perversion of the law, how, can, how you can use the law to hunt innocent people down only for moral or racial ideology. And what happened for, with a lot of ten thousands of homosexuals in Nazi Germany, they would put away in concentration camps, like others, like uh, political enemies, uh, like socials um, or from other religions or like um, Jews, as you he see here, the homosexuals had the rose uh, colored triangle and would put away in the um, concentration camps. I will show you for yeah, I will show you this photo just as an example in Sachsenhausen in Eastern Germany. So this is what you would put on a photo. Again, this photo is of course a propaganda picture from the Nazis to show of course um, how, how, uh, how bad those men are and how dangerous they are. Uh, so again, same ideology. And I chose some excerpts from a quite known text from uh, Rudolf Hess memoirs. It's no, known because of um, uh, the fact that he was the chief of the camp of Auschwitz. And this is why, why we know him. He testified in Nuremberg at the big trial. But in his memoirs, when you look at this, he's writing a lot about homosexuals. And here you see a second, I would say, a second trait in the Nazi ideology. It's not only the racial one, but the idea that um, homosexuality, uh, uh, when it comes to men, is a disease. And the job of the Nazis is to put the homosexuals in camps and try to, uh, to, to push them and to get rid of this disease. So you see, so he's talking about re-education in the concentration camps. So they would, they would put the, uh, they would put the um, um, uh, homosexuals into this con concentration camps and he would say, we have to put them all in one block in Sachsenhausen because it's dangerous for another man, for other men. So he's talking like, like they have a disease, like they would, uh, only their presence would make other men who are not homosexual, homosexual. And this is why those men suffered a lot in the concentration camps, because you see the same text, same, uh, uh, it's still hers. He's uh, talking about uh, Himmler, it's a typo here, who did even renunciation tests. And you have a lot of examples of this. It was a big taboo to speak about this after the war, but the Nazis tried in a lot of concentration camps to re-educate the um, homosexual, to uh, force them to have intercourse with, with women. And um, they would say to those people, if you, uh, be, uh, if you lose your homosexuality, then uh, you might go free. And a lot of men suffered because of this. A lot of men died 
only because um, they wanted to stay themselves or they wouldn't they didn't want uh, to accept what the Nazis pushed them to. So again, an example that especially I would say for, for if you're a teacher and you're working already with Hersa's text about Auschwitz, I would encourage you to see as well um, this ideology as well, to see that the uh, concentration camps is here used in a pervasive way to uh, cure uh, the homosexuals and to force them to a certain behavior. Sorry. So, um, I would say, yeah, if you see the numbers, this is the big problem that we have. And we encounter this with a lot of victims of uh, Nazi Germany. We don't know exactly how much uh, homosexuals suffered um, uh, during World War II. We know that uh, dozens of them, as you see, were in concentration camps. Uh, we know this from the lists, but unfortunately we don't know exactly how many uh, were killed. So as you see, for example, in Auschwitz only 75 um, homosexuals received pink triangles. Of course, there were much more homosexuals in, in Auschwitz than this. Uh, so when it comes to numbers, it's complicated to find out exactly how many perished. And there is still a big debate when it comes to lesbians uh, because the um, traditional reading of the history always said that, as I told you, um, Nazis would mainly uh, target men homosexual men and lesbians would be seen as a woman who could still have children. But in the last 20 to 30 years, we know that of course, a lot of uh, lesbian women would be, would, send, would be sent to concentration camps and suffered as well. We still don't know how many of them, but uh, newer academic works shows us as well that they were as well targeted by the Nazis and not only homosexual men. I'd like to, to come back to the aftermath because this is what shocked me the most again was that when I was a law student is it didn't stop with World War II when it comes to um, homosexuals. Uh, first of all, they couldn't speak out um, about what happened to them after the war because this article 175, it still existed. It was still forbidden to have relationships between men after the war. So of course, all the crimes committed against them weren't seen as crime from the Nazis, but everybody would say, well, it's still the law, so it's okay. So until, until the 80s, 90s, the crimes, the crimes against the homosexuals weren't recognized, neither by the German society, nor by the government. It took a very long time until the German government recognized uh, all the crimes that were committed against uh, homosexuals and uh, uh, the government would uh, nullify the uh, judgments against, against uh, the homosexuals. So uh, it took a very, unfortunately, a very long time. And even it was worse because I discovered that, for example, the um, German constitutional court that we're so proud of in Germany in 57 stated that the punishment of homosexuals is justified, that it does not violate the uh, fundamental law, that it does not violate uh, the, um, uh, the basic rights of a human being. And you can't imagine, but they would argue with the same arguments as the Nazis saying that when it comes to homosexuality between men, it's dangerous compared to women. So I was shocked. It's not, taught, it's not taught at all in law school. You have to look for it. Another case in the 60s, the um, higher, highest administrative court would strip uh, a state employee of his job because somebody denounced him that he was tried in 44 
uh, as a homosexual and put in prison. Can you imagine in 66, this was taken as an argument to take away a job from someone saying, you are not, um, you are not uh, worthy enough, uh, we can trust you with a job to be a federal employee. And another example, even, even uh, as, as bad as the two that I cited you, is what happened in Frankfurt in the 50s. Um, Kurt Ronimi uh, was a um, prosecutor during Nazi time, and um, he put hundreds of homosexuals away in prison. And you, want, and you know the bad side of the story of Nazi Germany is that a lot of prosecutors and judges kept their jobs after the war. You know, we don't speak about this in Germany, but unfortunately, there is no prosecutor or judge who was put in prison or put before a court for things that he did during World War II. And one of them was Kurt Ronini. He became a judge after the war in Frankfurt. And in the 50s, beginning of the 50s, he was obsessed of trying homosexuals. So he decided to take all the homosexual cases in his department to be able to try those people. And he had a hundred of cases. And unfortunately, it um, needed a big scandal, a big public scandal about this uh, to stop him. Why, unfortunately, because of all of these proceedings, we know that six, at least six men killed themselves because they were in prison and um, they, were, they were totally hopeless. And so in, only in 94, as you see, uh, a statue was built, a memorial was built to remind not only the victims of uh, the, the homosexual victims during World War II, but as well the victims after World War II. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm um, ready now to answer your questions. Um, yeah, Andres, thank you very much for your conference and giving us um, yeah, such new insights of this topic. Um, I think it would be really nice if we have some questions now. Uh, I can imagine a lot of people have um, yeah, questions to this subject. Um, I think... Uh, yeah, maybe uh, you can uh, write the question in the uh, chat. So we can... I see that Christopher Wallin has a question. I mean, he okay. read... Uh -huh. Okay, Christopher. Thank you. You mentioned Ravensbrück. My mother was in Ravensbrück, and I'm confused by your language. You were talking about homosexuals. Ravensbrück, as you know, was an entirely female camp. Are you using the term homosexual broadly, or? Uh, uh, André? I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't speak about Ravensbrück. I spoke about Sachsenhausen. Sorry, no, you did, was you a did speak. Of, you did speak about Ravensbrück. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't meant then. I did. I didn't meant Ravensbrück. I'm sorry. But you're totally right. You're totally right. Ravensbrück was a was a woman camp. Thank you. So if I if I mentioned Ravensbrück, it was it wasn't on purpose. How can you write a question here? Uh, well, I, can, I can verbalize it. Yeah, yeah, uh, you can verbalize it. Uh, just uh, uh, last, say it. Last year, I was in um, three camps. Um, Auschwitz, uh, Birkenau, and uh, Theresienstadt. And not once did I hear the mention of homosexuals. So I think if your purpose is to educate, I think that's a good place to start. There are so many people that are going there and they are not exposed to that part of it. Yeah, yeah, Melvin, I totally agree uh, because this is something you, not only you wouldn't, you wouldn't see it in camps, but unfortunately uh, 
I don't see a lot of books or when it comes to Germany, for example, I don't see it in, uh, in a lot of history books for students as well. So it's a topic you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, find out about it or hear about it if you are not searching for it. Uh, hi, my name is Matthew. I'm with the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. And uh, every, I, we're kind of a, a baby institution in the United States. And fortunately, our CEO has given me the privilege of doing pride programming every year for the Illinois Holocaust Museum. And at Dreisenstadt or Terezin, there's actually a memorial there for a guy named Freddie Hirsch, um, who I think uh, he was a openly gay uh, soccer coach, uh, sports coach, uh, who was sent from Dreisenstadt eventually into Auschwitz. Um, and he actually lived openly in Auschwitz in the family camp with his partner um, uh, and died under uh, sad circumstances, but... Um, uh, next time you're in Theresienstadt, Melvin, uh, poke around and look for the, the Freddie Hirsch uh, monument. And uh, if you're bored, uh, Google pictures of him. It's, it's not a waste of your eyes. Actually, I have been there twice and I have not heard anything both times. Uh, at this stage of my life, I doubt if I'd be getting there again, but thank you for that information. And can you please repeat his name? His name is Freddy, F-R-E-D-Y, Hirsch. Uh, and there's a beautiful documentary on him called Dear Freddy. And I highly recommend that all of you watch that. It's a, a beautiful insight into that um, particular uh, chapter of history. Thanks. Thank you. Andres, if I could have a question for you related to expanding on a discussion of homosexuality on Eastern Front, for example, in the Wehrmacht uh, and how that was seen. And uh, as you probably know, in some of those cases, alcohol and discussions of inebriation were taken into account in contrast to the SS where Himmler said that was not uh, exculpatory if you were drinking. So just uh, it would be interesting to know a little bit more about how those uh, attitudes uh, the Wehrmacht and the SS uh, approach those. Yeah, thank you, Edward. Uh, so, uh, a good question. I would say there, like with a lot of things, there was an official line that, of course, homosexuality uh, was forbidden as well for SS and, and Wehrmacht members. Uh, but like sexual uh, violence against women on the front, um, in most cases, it was tolerated. It was seen as an, a necessary evil. So uh, leaders would say, okay, it's on, what happens on the front stays on the front. Um, rape of women is not legal, but it's okay. And same thing goes uh, to, uh, to homosexuality. And uh, so we don't have a lot of uh, Verma trials, Verma cases, um, about this, I would say. But I think that, of course, the, uh, uh, there was a higher number of homosexuality or homosexual relationships than that we know. But again, this is the, the perversity of the Nazi system, that they always used and twisted their ideology when it, when it, when it comes uh, uh, in a good, as, a, as, a, as a good mean for them. So in this case, they would close their eyes and say, no, no, there is no problem at all. And um, if you would uh, see even, um, as you know, with sexual violence, uh, older academic books, you would, you would see that there were no issues about this. But I think, I think there were, and this is why I think uh, your question goes in a, in a good direction. This topic needs to be a more work. Uh, we have uh, Angel Del Valle, who is the director of the Holocaust Museum in Guatemala, who has a question. Um, okay, Andre, uh, my, my question has to do with, uh, well, as you know, I live in Latin America, so it's a very different context. And uh, we are basically very uh, ruled by religion and many other things like morality and, you know. So um, in some points, 
I, I see that that the persecution of uh, gay people or homosexual people in uh, men, especially during Second World War II, uh, how could they, I mean, how could they identify? I mean, if you just look at someone, if you just try to identify someone, I understand like in, in, my, in my environment, it's very difficult, you know, because uh, they are very rejected by uh, the church. You know, because we are under the church yet, but uh, but but how did they really identify or make sure they were? It's very difficult, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good point. This this is this is why they created this uh, this whole apparatus and a police who would uh, seek out uh, people uh, that they would that they would know that the, that they went to the clubs, for example, or gay bars. And then they would interrogate those people and pressure them. And, and of course, in an enhanced interrogation, say, okay, give us names. Give us names from Arab people that you know that my, that are homosexual. So uh, it was a pressure. It was a pressure. And uh, what I didn't tell is that from the 30, uh, from 33 on, a lot of homosexuals uh, try, try to stay uh, in, 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 and try to hide their homosexuals. There were a lot of um, couples, uh, men, and, men and women, that, that were only a uh, performer uh, just to show, to show the uh, investigator here, I'm married, I'm not gay. So it was crazy, but um, it was the same with, with the Jewish people. You know, how, can, how could you, how could you uh, see if a German is... Uh, uh, Jewish or not, or Roma, same thing. They would interrogate people and say, okay, say us, uh, who, is, who, who do you know else? Who is, who is, uh, who is a homosexual as well? And, and you saw, uh, you know, even after the war, homosexual, a forbidden homosexual relationship is already a kiss between men. So, uh, so this was enough. And even for the Nazis, they would say, okay, this, this, this man is homosexual only because the look he's give, is giving to another man. So again, their, their um, idea of homosexuality is not at all the idea that we have uh, today. Thank you. I think there's a question from Adele Black. Um, um, yeah, maybe you can um, give us your question. Adair? Hi, good afternoon. Um, my father was imprisoned in Birkenau before being sent to the coal mines of Yavishevich. And he spoke, when he was alive, he spoke to us about the fact that, I guess they were the block elsters, the, the men that were in charge of the barracks, that they, um, <clears throat> in his barrack in particular, that there was, um, he, he, the blockhouser would take into his little private room in the back men and my father said, of course, he believed that they were sexually abused. Has anyone ever addressed that aspect of um, homosexuality in, in Nazi Germany? Or with the yeah, Nazi th yeah, thank you so much, Adele, for sharing this because this is, this is a very crucial information because unfortunately, like I told, it was taboo to speak out about about what happened uh, in the camps when it when it came to sexual violence, uh, because because of sexual relationships between men were were forbidden even post war, so nobody would see uh, there a problem or as a crime. So of course, all what happened in the camps, survivors wouldn't speak about it or only very later. So if you see the first books. Uh, it's they are written even anonymously, so because people were afraid that they might they might have issues. Right. Thank but you. Thank you very much for 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 telling us. Thank you, uh, Andre. If I could ask a question, please. Um, will you say that um for the Nazi regime, the uh, men were more targeted than women? Yeah, I think, yeah, men were principally targeted. For a very long time, we thought, or academics thought, only men were targeted because, because uh, as I showed you, 
uh, lesbian women, they could have children. And this was women for Nazis, their only purpose were having children, nothing else. This, is, this was very clear for the, for the Nazis. So this, why, this is why the lesbians were, uh, let's say, tolerated. But with the time we found and scholars showed that on uh, certain lists of concentration camps, you could see that women who were put there were titled as lesbians, as reason why they would, would be put in the camp. So, so this, this might be a proof that um, lesbians as well were targeted, but not in the same systematic way as men. Because at the end, the men were mostly targeted because Nazis were afraid those men wouldn't have children. So homosexuals need, uh, needed to be um, excluded from the uh, society and put away in camps. Yep. It seems that uh, Matthew Seckel wants to answer or has to yeah, say I just, something I, to this. I had a question. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed, and I just wondered if you could confirm or, or elaborate on, is that once uh, the camps were liberated, even though they were liberated, the homosexual camp uh, members were sent then to jail and prison they weren't actually just let liberated again because they were still in violation of german law um could you elaborate on that i would say it depended yeah it's there are there are some cases yes where uh what because the fact is that they wouldn't those people who were in in prison uh in 45 uh, during liberation because of those charges, they wouldn't be uh, free because of course uh, Germans were said, well, it's still, it's still illegal. Um, but there are only few cases where people would be, uh, would be put away directly after then in prison because this is why people didn't, didn't speak about this and they hide, they hide this information because they were afraid. And, and this is why the first, as I told you, the first books were written in, in anonymously because people were, were uh, scared if they would uh, uh, they put their real name, they might go to prison because somebody might say, ah, you had forbidden relationships uh, with a man. So thank you very much for your questions. Yeah. I invite you, you can write me anytime. I will put my email as well in the chat and I can... Um, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Or perhaps, perhaps. Uh, uh, Andre, uh, if you want, I can put your. Yeah, please. Do, do uh, you're from Cologne, or? Yeah, any 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 email or the GMX email or or okay. any email you have from me. So, uh, you can reach out to me, and we can uh, discuss further. Or if you need any material uh, that I showed you for your class or um, uh, for your studying, mm -hmm. please. You're welcome. Can I ask a question? Yeah, may maybe last question, but I think uh, Andre has something, another class for in. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, Georgetown. I have, a, I have yeah. another class. I'm so uh, sorry. This is, uh, <laughs> this is why I'm. But again, please, please write me. Um, I'm. I will answer your question with pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Andre. And thank you. Thank um, you. for the other thank people, you. I would like to announce that uh, the next. Um, Behind Memory Conference uh, will be on uh, November 19th. And we invited Santiago Lopez Rodriguez from the University of Extremadura, and he will have a conference a speech about uh, contemporary anti Semitism in Western Europe. So you're all invited. We will send a, a new flyer with all the information to um, connect you via Zoom. So thank you very much for your participation and yeah, hope to see you in uh, two weeks. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations. Bye. Presentation. Goodbye.